Hey everybody, BTO Pro here. I forked some repo. I don't know, it's of just some person on the internet of which I have no affiliation. And I'm gonna offer feedback on it. So uh, this appears to be a CTA button. No idea why. Lots of people I know are building these right now. But what happened is this random repository was sent to me when it wasn't required. And so when one goes above and beyond the expectations, one gets feedback above and beyond the expectations. So I am going to clone this down, right? Got the CTA button, code, SSH, get clone, into CTA button, all right. CV, CTA, yeah, button. Minimum key press as possible at all times. Yarn install. So in class, we're making buttons. We're doing it using OpenWC. And we're spinning up the Hello World boilerplate and then kind of reverse engineering from there um, to learn how that is built, but also how to create a button. Buttons are deceptively difficult. Um, another guy on our team just the other day said, why didn't you do a card first? Because a card, while seemingly more sophisticated on the screen, is actually less sophisticated. It's kind of a dumb component, whereas a button has a lot to it. So, all right, I am, I have not spun this up. I don't, I'm assuming it works. So, we are at the start. Let's see what happens. Yay. Do I understand the assignment? All right, so it's disabled, which is great. I can't tab to it. And then there's a checkbox. And now I can. And now it takes me somewhere. <laughs> it takes me to the, yes, I did it meme. Ah, nice. All right. So for one, we've already got statefulness here, which is, uh, that's fantastic. Let's see. Um, we've got another part of the assignment is tab state, singular, right? So I tabbed it once. We're not getting twice. And uh, hover state alignment. So I am hovering this and I'm tapping to it. And we're achieving the same objective which is awesome. All right, so let's look at HTML here. All right, so we've got a super basic web component that's what this is all about. Let's move that over so we can see the AB comparison, all right? And so now if I check this, ah, uh, we can see it's disabled and we see the state reflected in the internals, right? So in the shadow root, we get the button is disabled and enabled. Right, so this is correctly applying not just the CSS styling as we see here, um, which I could also do this, right? Let's get rid of these. Right, so now it can, I can, you know, hover it, but I shouldn't be able to actually activate it because semantically it is disabled. So the color and the background are a nice touch, but the important thing is this attribute being set. If I get rid of that forcibly in the DOM, now I can click it, even though the tag above it has disabled set. And it's because this, the button naturally in HTML will respond to disabled and not be activated. Now it'll realign its state, I think, if, yeah. So then it'll realign it. Now I'll refresh, right, and we'll get the, what you had intended. Now let's look into, the code of set element. So one, let me point this out in class. Um, this is a personal preference thing. I personally, we don't make things this way on my team, um, but I understand why OpenWC has set up stuff this way. So the entry point is name of the tag.js, and then they import the class of the button and wire it up to the tag button. You could, and I'm not going to redo it, but you, this, in the way that we do things typically, our source will be the name of the tag and we'll have the class and the tag together. We will also export the class in case anything else would want access to it, right? So we would do something like this. Um, another convention that we like to use is uh, like this. So we'll do the name of the tag is exported with the button. And there's nothing in the spec saying you need to do this, right? That's why they didn't do it. So then we'll do static get tag return name of the button. Now, these static getters, in this case, they uh, allow you 
to access, there's only gonna be one instance of it, and it's gonna be the same regardless. So I can access that directly on the class. I don't need the class to be invoked, right? I don't need something um, you know, elsewhere uh, to say var abtn equals new CTA, uh, like in use as a class, if you're familiar with, with Java, be much more of Java-y. Um, so again, you only need to do it that way, just illustrating when we look at other examples, um, in the wild, it is more common. So let's look at what this element has going on here. So it's pulling in lit, duh. Um, then we've got static get styles suite. We've got the ability to override the color. Um, now I would say, okay, you've got CTA button text color. We've got font family. We've got CTA button text color. Um, we've got disabled button background and we've got font. So this is good like that it does this. So let's go through the positives first and then we'll get into the, the nitty gritty here. So this is good that it does that. Um, we're going to work on those CSS names. Properties. All right. We've got title, link and disabled uh, and disabled is reflected. That's why when I toggled that button, it was able to maintain state. Um, then we've got link that goes to the meme thing. And we've got disabled as true. Then we've got navigate to link. And we've got uh, rendering. All right, so the render is just a button. Class is assignment. It has an at click, um, which is lit convention, meaning once this is clicked, navigate to the link. Uh, which is going to do window.open. So always open the link in a new window. And then this is a correctly wired Boolean state for disabled. Sweet. So you put in a lot of extra effort, then I put in a lot of extra effort. But let's look at the demo before we get into that. Um, so demo. All right. So I've rewritten the demo. I hate the open WC starting point demo. It's not beginner friendly in my opinion. Beginner friendly at, would just be, here's the button and here's script type module, nothing else. But so you've reverse engineered this to get rid of that stuff, which is great. And then written some vanilla JavaScript, which is also cool that you went and even looked up what shorthand for arrow functions are, it's awesome. Um, so, all right, reading this, we set a background color. It's in English Great Britain addition. Um, then we've got script type module. We import the reference to the button, which is going to import CTA button, which is then going to import this. So that's the way these cascade. So you can keep building on other things. Um, then we've got window dot on load. So when the page loads, we're going to get element by ID and look for box, right? Add an event listener change. Nice. And then when it changes, event.currenttarget.checked. I'm not positive current target is uh, in can I use across everything, but let's, that's not the way I access that. It's not, let's say it's wrong. I'm actually now just curious about current target. I Okay, so you can use current target going back quite a ways. That's actually, that's good to know. Um, and when I use a, an API call like that, I'm looking into stuff like this just to verify, right? I look and go, oh, this has been supported since Firefox 2. It's supported everywhere. I think we're good. Now, there is also e.path uh, there. or uh, Yeah, there's path, there's target, there's current target. So there's a couple different variations of how to obtain that information. And if you don't know how to obtain that information, console log is always your friend, right? So I would log that and now as the state changes and it's there we go. Ooh, that's fun um so let's check right which generated an event and then i can go through and look for the event we can see that current target is null in this case which is a little weird let's hit it again and see what it says yeah so current target is coming up null in these cases, which is a little bizarre, to be perfectly honest, but target is coming up with the input itself. So if you need access to that, that's an important designation there. So looking at this, right, you have current target.checked. It's 
entirely possible that that doesn't actually return the thing that we're looking for. I mean, I'm console logging and current target claims to be null. So what I would do um, is tweak that, but let's let's look at the rest. Okay, so we have a demo. We don't need that. All right, so let's do that thing where I type really fast. Okay, so I get rid of the demo. Do I understand this assignment? That's awesome that you understood the assignment. Um, there's an issue here with disabled. However, let's fix this target thing first. Also, I don't write the word event ever. I always do E, but you know, shorthand makes it more difficult to read at times. So I would do E.target. The other thing, just for sanity's sake, I do E.target and somehow a change event is executed against this and target is null, you throw an error. So in this case, if somehow magically target would be null, it's never going to be null, but let's just imagine it's possible, then we're good. Now, the other thing, do we have an ID of assignment, but yet you're never using it. There's no reason for that. Uh, the BRs are all well and good. They're actually one of the few self-closing tags. Not that that's required because the DOM will fix itself anyway, but it's always nice to see. I'm also a stickler for tab order and spacing. All right, character set, we're good there. Style, I'm gonna actually make this so screw to that because we want it to be purely the thing in question. The other thing we can do, because this is script type module, I don't even need to import that. I could actually just do src equals dot dot slash cta and then we get a nice one line in the implementation, and yet it still works. That's just, you know, for your awareness, because and, and this helps helps people that are used to legacy JavaScript, um, right? Where you'd have like each individual one. The script type module tag can be fed in that way, but this is an identical implementation. It's the same. It's going to resolve in the exact same way. So um, now, fun thing from a performance perspective, we'll get into this a little bit today in class. This is a dynamic import, and a dynamic import will still work, but it will technically load faster. Um, you will start to see the text, the content of the page earlier in the page load. If I really wanted this to be optimal performance wise for you know this silly little demo, I'd also take the script tag and I move it to the bottom. And it's because, this is because HTML, the DOM parser, is going to go top to bottom through the document. Now, Google bot is, or not Google bot, um, Chrome's processing engine is also going to seek out things like script type module. There are other performance enhancements on top of this. The fun thing about our course website and about the project that all of this stuff is working towards is this has an insane amount of performance enhancements baked right into right into the interface. So in the course website, you know, I could actually just go to the course website, right click and hit view page source. And this is damn near a flawless, how you would go and do this optimal performance wise page load. Now, there are some intricacies in the way that we're handling an unbundled build process we'll get into when we get into build processes later on. But things like pre-connect, preload, module preload, other ways that you can basically cheat on time to first paint. Um, but you'll see even in our course website, we are loading these assets at the bottom of the document. So anyway, short little detour into build order. So let's go back to the site. Okay. So I would move that to the bottom. It doesn't have to be dynamic that way, right? So I move it to the bottom and it's slightly faster. I'm going to also get rid of disabled here. Now, the reason I'm going to get rid of disabled, um, also just so that we're in, I, el get element by ID is correct. You'll find a lot of documentation for it. It only works at the document level though. It doesn't work in shadow roots. And so as a result, I don't want people using it. So the equivalent is query selector and that. So think of the CSS selection, right? If I was to target and apply CSS to the box that has ID equals box, I could use the pound sign. And we'll be good there. So add event listener for change. Good work. Um, then do a query selector, unable disabled. Totally fine. Um, you could do this a little bit differently, where like each you know check of it effectively just flips it to the other direction. 
it's not the biggest deal. But anyway, um, this is totally fine. So I'm gonna hit save on that. All right, we're disabled. Undisabled. Now, the reason that that works, even though I took disabled off, uh, where is it? There it is. Off CTA button, right? This is just CTA button, blank, is because you have said this is disabled by default, which is wrong. So, the reason it's wrong is because now, without advanced logic, there's literally no way to undisable or activate the button. So, when we have state values like this that we are then reflecting and it has some negative or people will call this like truthy falsy uh type of case to it right so is disable falsy right okay so i can click the button but imagine there's no way to get truthy right there's no way to say oh well disabled is it disabled it, or sorry there's no way to get falsy if this starts as truthy it gets very confusing. so if disabled is always true and then something else has to deactivate disabled, right? I can't, as a developer, write the tag to not be disabled. It has to start disabled. Then I would click the button, which would then undisable it mathematically, and then you'd see it. So it's possible to be out of sync um, with the expected case here. So as a result, I'm going to do disabled as false. Um, also, there's no starting point for the title, even though there is for link and disabled. So I'm going to do this dot title equals click here because that's what you have, and then I'm going to turn that into a variable. All right, so I'm going to go there. This dot title save, and now we get the exact same thing, but it starts out right as active. Now when I check the box. We have a little bit of a state management issue there. So we need to change our demo a little bit now that we're saying that it's disabled out of the gate, right? And when the box is checked now, it's true, true. We're not a typer, geez. All right, and then it goes false, and then we're gonna change the input on it. And it's gonna say disabled status, right? Because now it's not disabled, and then when I check the box, it is disabled. All right, so now we've got a demo that makes sense, but it's also um, illustrating the state. Well, it's illustrating the state of the button, which is great that you had that before. Um, we also have title, which says click here. Now, the next thing I do is I would have the default case of the button, right? So I test that. Then I'd say title equals stuff and link equals, all right, do something like that. And change the hacks all the things. All right, so now when we say we get a hacks all the things button and our disabled status only applies to the first one because a query selector, if there's multiple matches, which there would be now because there's two CTA buttons, it will only apply to the first one. So it's only gonna return the first object, it, which means if I flip the order on these and hit save, now we will be disabling the hacks all the things button. So I would put uh, several different demos here. But next, we're gonna get into that CSS variable aspect. So I'm gonna do CTA button and we'll give this one an ID so we can mess with it a little bit. All right, so ID equals mess. And then I am going to add styles. Whoops. So we'll do style. And in here we're going to do mess. Now we've got to we've got to demonstrate that the CSS variables can be applied. Right? So we see here we have CTA button text color. I mentioned there's an issue here. Now, one, I said pick a convention. Personally, I don't camel case um, CSS variables. There's no, you're not going to find, I doubt you're going to find a blog post that says like do A versus B. It's just stick with a convention. That's always my, if you stick with a convention, then someone else can come in and go, oh, that's what the convention is. And so immediately, right, we've got this uh, dash case for variable names and camel case. Now, some of, um, I believe 
well, no, the pattern fly elements people came up with a different convention, but the, the convention that we generally use for naming of these things. So like, let's say I was about to add a, a default background attribute and it would be background hyphen color. And then I wanted to make a variable. What I do is I do dash dash name of the tag. This is always the way I personally name them, right? So it's CTA button. So I'm going to name it dash dash CTA hyphen button hyphen the thing in quote, like if there's some semantic meaning within the element. Now there isn't in this case, this is a very simplistic element. So I'm just gonna say the attribute name. So in this case, it's gonna be hyphen background hyphen color, comma, I'm gonna supply a default. So in this case, I'm gonna say it's transparent. Default is here. So, all right, there's a background color. It's gonna accept the background color. Now, this is a little weird because like on the host tag, you could you could just do this anyway. Um, and the more logical one to apply would be the button itself. Now you've set the background color on assignment right now for one, we don't even need a class for that because you won't have any other tags. You'll probably want a link tag that wraps a button. The way this has been done does work. So I'm going to roll with that. Um, so instead of assignment now, I'm just going to do button. Now, this is another school of thought type of a thing. Any article you would see would probably tell you never do this, right? Never just write CSS, a CSS selector that vague. It just says button. However, because we're always just working within the context of the shadow root, which is anything in this render function, I can write super basic CSS, which is a huge win for readability. Um, I'm not going to do doing the best of, of both worlds. Let's stick with class assignment. You're not generally supposed to hit a tag. And the reason that you wouldn't do that is if I were to refactor this and say, hey, ref equals, and I, you know, actually put in the link to the thing and then in here, put a button and you now said, oh, well, all of that styling has to be applied to the link. We just move to where the class name is, as opposed to changing all of these to say A instead of button. It's it's just kind of a, a thing you run into as you refactor over time. But um, okay, so we're gonna leave that as assignments. Um, these color variables. So here's a here's a discrepancy in color variables. So you have the disabled state of assignment, which is our button. And color is called the button's text color. Well, that's not true, right? Because we've got text color up here. So let's normalize these a bit. Let's get rid of that one. And then let's take text color and we're gonna apply it here. Whoops, we'll apply it here. So um, using your naming, I'll, I'll use your naming, I'll just get rid of this, right? So we don't want that dash case because you were using camel case for all of these. And so, this has to be applied not at the disabled state, it has to be applied at the button in general. Whoops, has to be applied at the button in general. And the reason we apply it at the button in general is because disabled, right? We have disabled button background. Now, camel casing again, stick with the convention, that would be disabled capital B button, right? So that is the background and then also color. There is background which could include color. So in, in my mind, it's important to be as specific as possible, right? Much like this isn't font, what you have defined here is font family, right? Because then you're setting font family to this value, right? And this is, and I, it's not that it's wrong here. In general, color and font size and font family are, and line height are some of the only attributes that actually do cascade through the shadow DOM. And it's not that they cascade, it's just that there's default set. And so the default setting of font family is to inherit from wherever else the thing is before it. So for example, if I was to just assume that setting a border property up higher would magically cascade and I'd get borders everywhere, that's not the way border works. However, font size and font family will automatically inherit from anything that is a higher order selector into the lower level ones. Still, it's it's good practice to set it uh, on the exact thing in question, in my opinion. Um, the other thing is, so if we're setting 
um, if we were to name these consistently, right? You have CTA button text color. And then what I would have is the state involved. So I would have like CTA button. And then I would have um, the state in this case, which is disabled background color. Or I would have background color and then disabled. Um, in this case, I'm going to say it's disabled background color because it's not normal, but then I should have some other case, which is not that, right? So CTA background color, in this case, we'll say it's white. So, oh, you have, act, you have background color is red here. Okay. So we're going to say, let's see, this is the disabled background color, right? And I'm going to copy those and we're going to throw it in for assignment. And then we're going to say, well, this is the normal background color. And then we are going to say, okay, well, there's a different state here. And I'm going to say that that state isn't disabled. It's, um, I'm going to say active. Now you have hover, focus, active, all aligned, which is great. You don't have to do that. I personally prefer aligning them in this way. Um, so I'm going to say active right, because it's the active state. And the active state here, I will now make red as the default, right? And now, take this, and now we're able to show this. So active background color, right? So now we've got all three states with an associated CSS variable to target it. Um, the font family, this will cascade through and apply. I can't really see a case where you'd want to toggle font family. Um, you have text color. Okay, so that's gonna be white on, uh, let's actually start this at, uh, at black instead. Um, all right, so I'm gonna save that. Let's see what we get. So we get this very high contrast right now. The other thing we do is I might say, okay, well, that's active background color. And then I'm just say active color. And I'd also modify this to be text color and just be color because it is the color attribute even though it applies to text, but I try to stick with just that value, right? Because if it's font size, which you should have font size, but if you have font size, then it'd be something different. If you have border, it'd be something different, right? So now I've got background, I've got button color, background color, okay. And then we need this to just be color and then background color is that, and then active color which active color is going to be white in this case and now we're going to take color and set this here so that now we have active color save now right we get that now this is an area of contention between um my coworker nikki and i she would say well you're using a button but you're acting like a link semantically you probably shouldn't do that it should probably be a link if there is a tag to be a link instead of using javascript i'm not going to get that in the weeds and, and you know critical of this uh, the window dot open you're doing this as a result of not having a link tag so you know you could have done this this way as well um and it's significantly less JavaScript involved, right? So we're going to say a href link. Um, the other area that we get into contention is that, in my opinion, if you hover a button and it's going to go do something, it should have a little pointer. That is not semantic. That's not the default of the browser. Links, however, do have the click and I'm going to go somewhere. So you either write the CSS or you just have it do it for you. So I would write this, but there's a link with a button in it. And then I need to say, because um, you have target blank there, which is fine, um, say target blank, so we get the exact same thing. And then I'm going to get rid of this navigate to link part. And, uh, and, oops. No, save. Let's see what we got here. Now, this is something that came up in class. I actually generated this here on purpose. You can see I tab through, I hit disabled status, which is great, that'll disable, but I can still tab to the thing because it didn't disable the link, it disabled the button. 
and now I can actually still just go to it. So I've caused myself an issue, but I also can tab to both of these. And the interesting thing about the way click events work with a link that has a button in it, when you tap a button, the click event will bubble up from it. So watch. Even though I was navigated to the button, it still goes there. Now I have focus on the link because it's the default, hey, a link is selected. It also goes there. And you might go, well, it's not really a big deal. And if you're a non-sided user or someone that has to use a keyboard and there's several hundred links on a page, it becomes a big deal. So do the right thing. <laughs> so the way to solve that is I say tab index equals negative one. What this does is it tells the screen reader, you know, tab order, keyboard user to avoid that when keyboard is the input. So now I just go right to the button because the button does have a tab index, but the tag above it doesn't. And because the click will bubble up when I activate it, it still hits the right thing. And now if I disable, I get the expected behavior. I can't go to it. I can't click it. I can't do anything, even though the button is the thing disabled, not the thing above it. Kind of cool. So um, there's also the rel equals no opener. I think that's what it is. That's what you're supposed to do. Rel equals no, I can't remember the rel equals no opener. Goodness. Okay, yay, yeah, 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 yeah. no opener. And you can actually put both in. Um, there we go. So that makes Chrome happy. Um, the other thing with these CSS variables, and I'm just going to write the initial stub so you can see, but um, let's go into our demo. I would want to go into my demo and say mess, and then I would want to use those CSS variables, right? So let's say um, the active color, right? Active color is orange, and the CTA button active background color. See how it's, it starts to become easier mental model wise um, to do it this way, right? If you know that's what it is, it's going to be the tag name, then the state, then the, uh, the uh, attribute in question. And I can start typing them without even having to think about what the variable name is going to be, you know, because then I'm looking back and forth. And again, so I keep emphasizing in class and I will is I'm very lazy. I don't want to ever have to look at this. I just clicked here and then I explained it to you. These are seconds of my life I will never get back. So learn you know, tab off and name things appropriately. So now, right, there's my active state for that third button, right, which is mess, and mess has these values on it. Now, because what we're doing is data, right? I didn't set a link on mess and it's the default. So another fun thing you can do as far as illustrating that you know what's going on, I could do a query selector. And now I can target mess. And because we have properties, right? So this is a, an important thing to get down over time here is let's take mess and make this up. if I say disable, that is an attribute. An attribute is just the textual representation of this value. It's weakly typed, which means the DOM doesn't know that's really a Boolean. It kind of just goes, there's an empty string. I guess that means it's false, or it's, it means it's true in this case, true being to disable. But building web components, we have a full typed class object bound to this HTML tag. And as a result, we can query it and we can do whatever the hell we want to it because it's JavaScript and it's a class. So I can say query.selector.mess.title equals cool stuff. And now I am dynamically setting this to be cool stuff via JavaScript. We still got click here. We've got our other, and I can disable that after the fact, right? And that's actually working with it view data, but you're seeing it as an attribute. The other neat thing, and I'll just console log this for fun, is I could do document query selector mess, and now I could do dot shadow root. And when I do that, it says open, and I can open it, and we can see what the shadow root is. So 
while you're not supposed to do that, this is not you know the thing to do, right? Because we want to work with our tag as data. That shadow root that can be queried internal to the element, right? Because shadow roots can have query selectors on them, means that I could do something like dot shadow root dot query selector uh, a dot um, disabled. Or no, I do it set attribute disabled disabled. And when I do that, there's mess. Let's see if it actually did it. All right, so there's a shadow root. See, it's set disabled to disabled. So this is where I don't totally understand people's argument. Like there's a lot of people that are really virulently against web components. Um, and it'll be, well, there's those shadow roots. And so I can't access the stuff. You can't access it with a global selector. But if you're thinking of these as objects in the page, you can keep walking down through these roots to get to the thing that you really want to be at. Now, with what we're doing in class, we don't have a need for this. With what my team does, as much as possible, we try to avoid behavior like this. But if we get in a pinch and there's something weird with like event management, right? We're listening for an event on something above and maybe we have to cancel it within. We can we can still get access to it. Generally, you're not supposed to do this, but you can. So I'm going to point it out. So we can alter the title because it's data in this case. Other fun thing, we could... Um, we could add additional event listeners, right? There's an, ad, an event listener added to that, but we could add other event listeners to our button to do different things, intercepts, you know, change the, the going with default behavior, stuff like that. Um, so I did, one of the requirements is a property that can manipulate the styling. And it could be a dark mode, invert, um, a specific color, something like that. So I'm just going to stub out some of this. Um, and so I would say invert, much like you have disabled it, right? So I do invert type Boolean reflect true, which means now I've got a property that we're going to monitor for in here, changes to, and, and apply those changes. But those changes also get applied up here, right? So we're kind of keeping these in line. Now I need to set a default, so I'm going to do it's not invert it's false right so i always you know then if someone wants to invert it they can set that attribute and then and i'm only going to write it for part of it but what we could do then is we could say colon host invert now i can take the background color, and we are going to say that it is black by default, and then we can take the color and say that it's white. And I'm not going to apply this to other use case, you know, context here. You'll have to do that. However, now to verify that it's stateful, I can go to this button and I can type invert, and now we've effectively flipped the colors of the button. It's not that we flip the colors of the button though. We flip the CSS variables. The CSS variables cascade through and update automatically. This is the key distinction that I've seen uh, several people miss so far. So right now, because I changed the default value of CTA button color, everywhere CTA button color variables used in the CSS updates to match that. So what I want you to do is take this, I am actually gonna issue help post this up and issue it as a pull request back to your thing uh, because you put in all this extra effort uh, in between class periods. So I'm going to push this up so you're on the same page with some of this. Other people can watch this video and realize what we mean by reverse engineering some aspects of what uh, you've done here. But this is a good, a good first start. It gets a large portion of the way into the initial requirements of this tag. Um, so, work, I'm going to go push this up. If you're not familiar with, you know, pull request that or how that works, it should be, all right, good status. I see, hey, these files have changed. Um, 
I'm going to actually I'm going to modify the git ignore to ignore the lock file. You get into some serious issues sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, let's modify. So we're going to say um, yarn dot lock. All right. There we go. And what that'll do is um, the yarn lock file, so you can see it. Um, it's auto-generated, right? It says do not edit this file directly. It, when you run yarn install or npm install, npm will do the same thing uh, or a similar thing. It's going to go make those resolutions, I said. And you see the little progress bars tick across. It has to go and find, um, for example, uh, like some Babel plugin that you don't even know is running. I mean, look how stinking long this file is. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's 6,500 lines. Um, but what it's doing is it's saying, hey, I went and I traced every dependency needed to use this. These two projects are looking for this version. Oh, we'll resolve it to this version. And hopefully if everything works out, everybody is in line with the same version. There are times where you'll get asked like, hey, this thing says it requires version one. This thing requires version two. Which should I use? So this file is helping maintain that relationship. As a result, we don't really want to ship that file around if, as we start adding dependencies. Um, so I have ignored that, saved some issues later. But I'm going to do git add hyphen a, git commit m, advantage of working ahead, between classes. Okay, git push origin main. Um, another thing, oh my Zush does this for you. A couple of you have noticed this. The little X means there's things to commit. It also is showing me that I'm on the main branch here. Love oh my Zush. Highly recommend getting it. A couple of people have asked why I have a green terminal. I modify the colors of mine. There are, you'd have to read up on a platform basis as to how to do that. I think it's under preferences here. Um, yeah, you can modify the the theme. Um, the reason I do that is for readability. Oh, there we go, it's under preferences, colors, yeah. So I go and I modify the color palette of mine um, so that it's really high contrast, like obnoxiously high contrast. You can see I don't always get it right because this git is in dark blue, but I also don't care about the word git, right? My eyes are naturally drawn to the folder I'm in, whether or not it's in version control, and the, the branch that I want, which is primarily how I use the whole stinking computer. So, all right, that's pushed up. And now, go up to my CTA button, full screen, refresh, all right, advantage of working between class. And then I'm gonna issue a pull request back to this repo. It's gonna show me all the changes, which is very nice. Create pull request. And then I am going to add this video into said PR. And all right. So hope this was useful to other people. See that there's lots of different ways of solving any problem in programming, whether this is web components or not. But I hope this is useful to you. I'll post some links up uh, to other materials in this repo in question. Catch you later.